So do I start off as like, hi, my name is Mike, I'm an alcoholic? <laughs> no. <laughs> First of all, I'm a latchkey kid, and my parents, they did the best they could for me. And so when I was 11 years old, uh, they put me into a, a Catholic school. I ended up being molested at the time by a Catholic priest uh, who caught me drinking Greek and wine in the back. And, uh, and it opened up the door for, for shameful fear and just, just upsetting behavior. Um, and he would give me alcohol in order to have his way with me. At 13 years old, I was introduced to methamphetamines on my birthday. Um, at 16, I was informed of how to cook it myself, uh, which, was a, which was basically a curse. I was a daily drinker, absolute vodka in high school. I only made it through high school for three years. I couldn't keep a job because I was drunk or I was hungover or loaded, and so I had trouble keeping work. I didn't start going to jail until, well, actually going to jail on my 18th birthday for drunk in public, um, intoxication. Um, it didn't seem like it was a problem. Um, and then that was just the beginning of a lot of series of, of going to jails and coming out, going to jail, coming out. In the early days, the jail that I would go to, there was just as much drugs in the streets as there was inside the jail, you know? And, um, and so, I mean, I remember being with one of my friends who has passed away now since, but I remember being with him on his birthday and him saying, let's go get arrested so I could be with my dad and get loaded. You know, it was like a normal thing. Um, and so we'd go and get into trouble and, and throw newspaper machines through windows and, and then get arrested, you know? Then eventually I got tired of that lifestyle. Um, I was with a lady and, and she ended up being pregnant. And so we decided to move to, to do a geographical up to Sacramento. And uh, the problem is, is I took myself there. You know, and I just found new people to hang out with that are the same situations that I had in common. And I figured my problem was just stop looking for methamphetamines. Um, as soon as I got to Washington, I got involved with a bunch of loggers and they started drinking at four in the morning. And I'm like, cool, this is some my kind of people. And so I'd start drinking early in the morning, pass out by nine, wake up again at noon, drink some more. And that became my lifestyle up there and somebody offered me methamphetamines. And, uh, and that, was all, that was it. So I had a seven year period of, of clean time at that time, but I was still drinking. In recovery, I've heard that you never just take off, you don't start fresh, you take off where you left off at. And it's usually more extreme than before. And so then I started using methamphetamines intravenously and, um, and that was just the beginning of the end for me, basically. I went on a seven year run to the point where I was in and out of jail again. Um, there was no hope for me. I couldn't keep a job. Um, I was homeless. I had an island that I was living in a tent on. Uh, somebody had told me at one time, they says, you know, you'll never hit rock bottom as long as you continue to dig. And so I just thought, well, maybe I need to just keep digging and digging and digging. And then I hit rock bottom when I decided to finally surrender. Um, I called my mom and asked her for help. I'm just doing drugs and I'm doing them intravenously. I'm hanging out with a bad crowd. My mom has to kick me out of the house. I go homeless and I'm homeless and on the streets. I'm pushing a shopping cart. I'm recycling copper out of buildings. I'm selling drugs. I'm doing everything that that you just despised happening. Then I broke into my mom's house and I moved back in there without, cause she got married and moved out. And so the house was empty. So I went ahead and squatted in it and I got raided. And the, it, was, it was all bad. And to see the disappointment on my mom's face of my only son has done this to me. And the possibility that my mom would lose the house that they worked so hard to get because of my selfishness. Um, enough was enough. A priest named Tom Wesson came in and talked to me, he spoke to me, and he talked to me about program and recovery. And it was the first time I've ever heard of program recovery because it's an anonymous group. People don't talk about it. And so I didn't know that there was some way out, another lifestyle. 
And so he spoke with me and been hearing it from a Catholic priest because I already had my, my reservations about the Catholic Church, you know, what happened to me in my past. And he spoke to me about forgiveness and learning that I had to forgive in order to forgive myself and I needed to forgive the person that harmed me when I was younger. I just needed something. And so him and my stepdad got together and they did some research and they come back and they says, well, we found you a spot that'll take you. I said, really? And they said, yeah. I says, is it warm there? And he says, yeah, it's warm. Is there sand? Yeah, there's sand. Palm trees? Palm trees is it. I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to Malibu. I'm going to Passages. I'm thinking this is it. And he says, no, you're going to Bakersfield. I said, where is Bakersfield? When I got released from this jail up north, whenever I would leave the jail, I would always take that same path that I always took every single time. And within 10 minutes of being released, I would be loaded. This time I thought, you know what, I'm gonna give recovery a chance. And I took a path that I never took before. And so I waited for my stepdad to pick me up and he took me and drove me down here and dropped me off. And so I went to the Salvation Army over on 19th Street and, and I'm looking at that building and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me, this is not Malibu. And so my stepdad says, you better make this work. And he gave me a three year restraining order against my mom so that I would never hurt her again. At that time, as an only child, I felt so alone and so stuck that this was going to have to work. I was going to have to make this work. So I had to basically hold on to myself here in Bakersfield by, with nobody. I started going to meetings and getting involved in recovery. I started getting more and more involved. It became my life. Um, I got a job. Um, was able to be employed. And then I started working for a company in retail and I worked my way up from a cashier up to an assistant manager. Once again, once I start getting the drugs out of my system, my brain starts to work again and functioning. You know, and I did that job for six years. And then I left that job to go into recovery and start working in recovery. Never thought that this is where my life would lead me to. I continued to go to four or five meetings a week I continue to work on my recovery. I work with others. I have a sponsor and I have sponsees. On September 8th, I will be celebrating 10 years clean and sober. And that day means more to me than my birthday that's coming up. This is a big year for me. 10 years of sobriety and I'm turning 50. You know, a lot of people have excuses. Of, well, my mom died or whatever. You know what? There's people in recovery that have gone through that and hadn't had to use. You know, it's a, a medication that you want the instant results from. And recovery is not something you can have instantly. And it does come gradually. And, and because of it coming gradually, you really start to feel and appreciate every single minute of it. You know, the promises talk about how painstaking about this journey you may be, you know, and there's gonna be some times where you do have some rough times, but at least you don't have to go off and use over them. Wow, they stole a lot. Um, my addictions, it, I wasn't present for my children. I have two kids, <clears throat> a daughter and a son. Uh, and their mom was caught up in an addiction life too. And so there were some times where I moved away and, and I figured if no good news is good news, uh, if I didn't have anything good to share with them and I stayed quiet and just stayed out of their way, then I was doing well. So the, one of the things that it stole from me was the fact of being, being available and present for my kids. Uh, being a good son for my mom, you know, my mom wanted the best for me and she didn't want me to have to go through the stuff that, that I went through. Now, recovery has given me this. I have a seven-year-old grandson and a four-year-old granddaughter that has never seen grandpa loaded or drunk. I am present for them. I'm able to take trips with my girlfriend and her son up to, to see my family. I'm able to be a son for my mom, and I drive up to the Bay Area every two months to see my mom. Um, 
that's given me something that's got, you can't put a value on. I've been employable. I go to work and I work hard day. I take my boots off at the end of the day and I'm proud to be there, that my feet hurt. My, wor my world these days are wonderful. I get up every morning with a smile on my face and that's because I get to help the next person. I see these people on the streets and I pray for them. You know, I, it's available for them. All you've got to do is want it. And, um, and I hope to God that, that someday recovery will be taken care of and people will be, will be, will be cured of this disease. Because uh, the disease of addiction is, is just like a cancer. Oh, and then with recovery, I also ended up getting some teeth, <laughs> you know? And in my addiction, I lost my teeth. And in recovery, I was able to get some dentures and be happy with them and have a good smile and be able to look myself in the mirror every morning.